This is actually my third microcontroller project. The objective here was to turn my old Nintendo NES controller into a USB joystick so I can play the emulated video games on my computer. Um, here's what it looks like on the breadboard. It all looks a little bit confusing, uh, but we'll get to the to the drawing a little, a little bit later and try to work out what all this does. Um, Real quickly though, uh, we have three um, control ports, basically. Um, we have uh, port one, which is gonna go to the NES controller. Um, number two, which is gonna go to the USB on my computer. And number three, which is gonna go to my uh, PIC programmer, which I happen to use the microchip PIC kit three programmer debugger, which um, seems to work pretty well for me. Uh, I've only programmed two chips. This one, which is the PIC18F2455 microcontroller, and also the demo board, which came with the PIC3 controller, which is, um, it looks like that is the 45K20. <clears throat> so, um, most of this design came from a guy named uh, Drew Hall from ZeroSoft. I also got a lot of information from David Kowalski's website about how the Nintendo controller actually worked, although I didn't use his design, even though it was pretty a fairly clever design. Um, he used direct inputs uh, rather than using the parallel to serial connector that is actually in the Nintendo controller already. Um, also, I should thank RetroZone. Um, Drew Hall's design looks suspiciously like theirs. I don't know who took it from who, but um, thanks to both of them. Um, I did end up using Drew Hall's uh, open source software uh, to run this, so um, that is pretty much the backbone of the entire thing. <coughs> um, so I made a few changes from, from his design just because I didn't have some of the parts. I used this uh, two-port ceramic resonator rather than his three port in his design um, and what you have to do is just use these uh, ceramic capacitors to ground on the outside in order to give stability to the to the resonator <coughs> um, that's a big modification I guess um, the biggest anyway uh, so far I just have the NES controller hooked up from the end of the cord uh, like this and eventually this will all go inside the controller itself. Um, this whole port right here will be just gotten rid of. Um, these will be connected directly to the chip and the USB um, section will also be connected right to the chip and that will get rid of most of the bulk of these wires so hopefully it will all fit inside when I'm done. Um, I may have to trade in these guys for the three port uh, resonator just because it's smaller. And of course, I'm going to need a, a different capacitor besides this one. I just use this decade capacitor because it's it's so handy. <clears throat> and um, let's take a look at the at the at the design and at the drawing. Um, I I was having some trouble looking at um, the layout from ZeroSoft, which is it looks like looks like this. Um, and this is for a PCB board, so. I did not use his PCB board that so I had to, I just redrew it so I could see it a little better <clears throat> um, let me make sure you can see that on the screen I'm not sure if you're gonna be able to see this hopefully you will um, <clears throat> let's take a look first at this at uh, port J1 over here in the corner I'll use some mouse Here it is. This is. These are going to be the colors of the of the the actual wires inside the NES controller. Um, I had trouble finding this on the internet. I just had to uh, poke around with with some um, with some probes to figure out which colors were which. Everyone had the layout for the actual the actual pins. They all knew this, but no one mentioned what the colors were. So here they are. Um, white is your voltage. Yellow is going to be your data. Red is going to be your clock. Orange is latch, and brown is ground. 
Um, before I actually um, tested these, I was obviously trying to get red to be voltage, and I was having a lot of trouble with that. So it's not, it is clock and not not your voltage. Um, <clears throat> so your data line is going to go into pin 2 of your microcontroller. The clock data, the clock is going to go into pin 3. The latch is going to go into pin 4. And your ground, obviously, is going to go to ground. You can connect pin 8 here if you want. Um, obviously, your grounds can be connected anywhere. They just have to all touch <clears throat> in the end. Um, the voltage is going to come from from your USB or your programmer, so um, that'll that's going to branch off and and uh, probably meet up around around here somewhere or wherever. Um, let's take a look at at port two, I guess. Um, here it is for the USB. Um, these co these wire colors are all standard. I I looked them up on Wikipedia. Or you can go to the USB website to figure out what colors they are. <clears throat> or just look here, I guess. Uh, red is your is your hotline, the voltage, uh, VCC. White is your D minus line. It's going to go to pin 15 of the microcontroller. Um, green is your D plus. It's going to go to pin 16 of your microcontroller. And black is going to be your ground. And you can connect it to pin 19 or uh, again wherever you want, as long as they touch ground. Um, pin 20 on the PIC controller is going to be another voltage um, and that's going to go meet up with the rest of the voltages VCC um, so let's take a look at at port J3 this is to the programmer now um, pin 1 of this port is going to be VPP this is the voltage used for programming the, the, the chip itself um, that's going to go to pin 1 of your microcontroller <clears throat> and it's not going to connect to the VCC's you're going to have a separate VCC coming out of the programmer, and that's going to go to meet up with the rest of the VCCs. Um, <clears throat> you can have a ground line coming out of out of your programmer. Uh, it's going to go meet up with other grounds. And your programming lines, PGD, which goes to uh, port 28, and PGC, which goes to port 27. Now, I have no idea what color um, wires you're going to use, so I just numbered them here. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, and six. Six, I don't know if anyone actually ever uses that. I have no idea what it's for, but I, I've never used it yet. Um, <clears throat> one thing to note, you probably don't ever want to have your USB J2 connected while you have uh, your programmer J3 connected. I was having a lot of problems with that earlier. Um, don't do it because you're going to have some competing voltage lines. Uh, so something to avoid. Um, I didn't break anything when I did it. It just it gave me a lot of errors, and I was having a huge headaches with that. <clears throat> um, so let's head over to the oscillator section over here, um, pin nine and ten. Um, doesn't matter which which way these things are connected. I think they are um, bidirectional devices. It just it won't know. Um, so here you have your, your resonator. You can use a quartz resonator or a ceramic resonator, um, two port or three port. Uh, the three port obviously is the easiest and it's um, smaller because it has these capacitors inside of it. Um, but if you do not have a three port um, resonator, uh, you're gonna have to have some sort of capacitance on the outside to add stability to it. Um, you want to be around the 40 picofarad range, I believe. This is all in the in the PIC data sheet. It might actually be a little bit lower than that. I'm actually using 100 picofarads per capacitor, which it seems to work out pretty well. Um, the downside is supposed, supposedly a slower startup, which I haven't noticed a slow startup at all, so I seem to be okay with that. And then um, that goes to ground after that. After that so... Um, there it is. Um, the reason why I, I happen to use um, capacitors in the, and this resonator, I just got them out of some other equipment that I don't use anymore. I, I think I took one out of um, one of the resonators out of a telephone or something, like an old portable telephone. So that's why I kind of changed parts a bit. <clears throat> uh, let's see what's next. <clears throat> 